Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, and you know, Christian, <laughs> I'm like, part, so part of my presentation, lessons from the HIV movement, communicating for health justice will be sort of part, you know, sort of analysis and then some part, you know, kind of, you know, skills pieces. But given that uh, kind of opening, I was like, oh, I didn't know we were going to really be you know, so much an activist <laughs> kind of meeting because I might have prepared a whole different talk, but you know, I'll I'll infuse some of that in uh, my my remarks today. Um, so so thank you. Um, so uh, I am currently the managing director of advocacy and organizing with the relatively new organization called Prep for All, which is a national uh, organization founded in 2018 to uh, just generate more kind of activism and advocacy around access to PrEP uh, in the United States. Um, I have uh, about a 20, it's, it's starting to now kind of like, you know, hit me in my throat when I have to say I have a 20 plus year career. <laughs> like, oh, am I that old now? Yes, you are. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I've been working for more than 20 years in a range of, of social justice uh, movements, primarily uh, in communications, media strategy. Uh, also, I'm a journalist as well, uh, and the former uh, senior editor of thebody.com, which is a news and information uh, platform, uh, primarily focused on HIV, but also includes sexual and reproductive health, LGBT health, et cetera. Um, so, um, and one of the reasons I love this image, uh, which was uh, from a protest uh, in 2020, and as Christian sort of pointed out, um, is a real um, kind of bringing together of, of issues in terms of uh, our society. So you have people ostensibly at uh, one of the 2020 George Floyd uh, you know, uh, sort of support protests around the country, but bringing together these issues around race, around public health, around Black Lives Matter, et cetera. And I think in Christian's remarks, a lot of these things may seem disparate in terms of how we often uh, do our work as, as advocates and, uh, you know, it's sometimes necessary, but also to know that these systems uh, are actually connected. Uh, so again, that's uh, us at Prep for All. So let's talk a little bit about sort of, you know, communication in terms of, of public health, right? So, you know, when we talk about health communication, we talk about strategies to, you know, aim to change people's knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, you know, so as a lot of work in public health communications around risk perception, you know, reinforcing positive behaviors that we want people, a lot of the COVID washing hands and wearing masks, right, would fall into those category and influence uh, social norms. So to talk specifically about um, the HIV epidemic, um, as Christian sort of raised, um, we have to often think, especially as public health advocates, thinking about the way things go from uh, our tools like the MMWR, as things are often reported, and how those things then get translated into media um, for various different purposes and how the disconnect sometimes between those two or sometimes the way our sort of public health messaging fails to better inform uh, media journalists and also the way the public sort of perceives issues. So we know, um, you know, June 5th, 1981, the uh, now kind of legendary MMWR uh, really identifying pneumonia in uh, five healthy young men um, as the MMWR was framed to the way in which that became interpreted by news uh, organizations after that. And so you can see some of the news clippings, uh, you know, uh, rare cancer seen in 41 homosexuals from the New York Times, which is all another kind of famous piece from that, you know, two uh, gays conspire to infect society and these other sort of like news outlets, right? Some of that sounds familiar based on some of the cable news outlets that we uh, have to live through today. Um, so, but these, these uh, things are, uh, are, are real. So oftentimes in our public health kind of messaging, we um, fail to sort of make the kind of proper distinction between risk and prevention and problematic people, 
right? Which is often how things sort of become, you know, uh, interpreted. So here I just listed some of the things early, some things that we, you know, are true, but some things that were also kind of early assumed in the HIV epidemic and how then they got sort of interpreted around different sort of uh, constituents, right? So we know unprotected, you know, anal or vaginal sex, right, is this bloodborne pathogen. There was also in the early 80s, the sort of, you know, bathhouses were the cause that poppers, right, caused HIV, you know, these sort of things. And, um, one of the luckily sort of uh, interventions, if you will, by gay men uh, early in the epidemic was creating the toolkit out of GMHC when they first started, how to have sex in an epidemic, which helped us create the sort of framing around safe sex, right? And often when I'm talking to young people, I have to remind them that that was not a concept that existed before the 1980s, right? And that's messaging, right? That's media, that's, that's media strategy, right? Is, developing an easy framework for people to then understand a set of like tools to use in order to like have, you know, uh, safer sex and, and HIV prevention in, in that in that way. Um, and I'll obviously getting tested. Um, and then, of course, we had the kind of ways in which HIV was discussed. So going from sort of risk perception and risk prevention to problematic people, right? Many of us old enough to remember the full, kind of four H's as it was framed, right? Homosexual hemophiliacs, Haitians, and heroin users. We then, by the like 1990s, started to really focus on uh, on Sub-Saharan Africa as we were seeing the epidemic emerge there. Into the 2000s, there was the whole sort of, which I wrote and spent a lot of time debunking the myth of down low bisexual uh, black men as the cause of HIV, high HIV rates among uh, black women. Some ways that we've evolved uh, that messaging is um, through another sort of activist campaign to understand, once we understood roughly 10 years ago that for people living with HIV, viral suppression meant, um, so if people were on uh, their antiretroviral medication and achieve viral suppression or what we call an undetectable viral load, that they could not actually transmit the virus through sex to their sexual partners, right? Even without condoms or other barrier methods, right? I see a couple heads exploding as I say that. So that is true. We know that from studies with hundreds of thousands of people at this point. Um, and so the fact that even in this room, that is a surprising uh, uh, notion, despite the fact that it has been, we've known scientifically for the last 10 years that to be true, says something about our kind of health communications. So uh, an organization, uh, Prevention Access Campaign, sort of formed several years ago and created the kind of a more community-driven way to talk about it, the sort of U equals U or undetectable equals untransmittable, uh, which is spread all around the world, right, in terms of getting uh, breaking the sort of stigma for people living with HIV um, and helping people who are HIV negative understand that actually their sexual partners, if they're actually engaged in healthcare, uh, pose no you know, sexual risk to them in terms of transmission. Um, and then obviously, as I work on PrEP, right, pre-exposure prophylaxis, right, this, this year, July will be the 10th anniversary of the first drug approved uh, to prevent HIV, which works uh, in terms of preventing HIV better than condom use in that sense. And we still have swaths of the population who don't know that that exists, right? Um, but now moving towards in our kind of public health messaging, um, this kind of idea of status neutral where HIV is concerned. So if you're HIV positive, there's a way for you to stay healthy and also not um, be, have to be concerned about transmission of HIV to your sexual partners. And if you're HIV negative, there is a prevention option that you can use other than condoms to prevent HIV. So uh, the campaign, these two campaigns come from uh, New York City and New York State. And so the We Play Sure and a lot of the sort of HIV public health messaging now, we're really talking about status neutral approaches to uh, you know, talking about HIV prevention, whether people are positive or negative, and ways when people enter the health systems, you know, how people can still sort of engage in, in primary care and in preventative care, despite their HIV status. Right, so we saw some of the same, um, you know, kind of issues come up in COVID, right? Problematic people versus risk prevention. So, you know, the uh, ways in which 
uh, you know, uh, politicians who shall remain nameless uh, really try to um, inject this certain amount of racism and xenophobia in uh, the way we thought about uh, coronavirus, um, you know, and and just straight up blaming uh, China or, or Asian communities, which is connected definitely to the ranges of physical attacks that we saw in Asian Americans in the United States over the last several years. So again, it's one of those things that we have to be very clear about in terms of how we communicate risk origin of viruses and what that means uh, that doesn't uh, translate into uh, harassment and violence against particular populations. Y'all with me? Okay. <laughs> so, um, so I'm gonna shift a little bit and talk more about sort of messaging creation, right? What are the strategies that communications experts use to develop real sort of advocacy strategies to sort of, you know, uh, highlight an issue, uh, frame it for the public or for decision makers as advocates, uh, and also to uh, you know ask for or demand uh, things right at, at the end of that. Um, a lot of times in um, you know messaging that we do for you know people who are have have survived particular conditions like C diff or cancer or people living with HIV, et cetera. You know we focus a lot on you know helping people learn to sort of tell use their individual stories. Uh, for advocacy, which can be important. But I often tell people one of the things that I caution against is having people use their personal stories in a way that become exploitive or kind of cautionary tales, as opposed to pointing towards systemic institutional policy, legislative, infrastructure problems, right, that need to be addressed, right, as opposed to trotting people out to just tell their stories and there's not a clear shift in how we think about it or forces the listener to think differently about um, what is these sort of institutional problems that led this person to their diagnosis. So here, uh, just two images, you know, obviously the uh, silence equal death is one of the most kind of legendary um, kind of activist calls um, in the case of, of, of HIV is a call to really uh, have people who are living with HIV tell their stories um, and, and as, a, as a kind of organizing tool and an activist tool uh, to demand research, treatment, care, infrastructure for people living with HIV, uh, again, out of, out of ACT UP, um, to also like the Green New Deal, right? Which I think is a, I would love to know like who came up with the sort of messaging around the whole host of kind of climate policy, uh, you know, related as a way, I think, to sort of move from the debate around, you know, is, you know, is it global warming? Is it, you know, climate change? Is it real or not? But because particularly Americans uh, who of, you know, over a certain age sort of know about the, the New Deal, right, as a progressive set of policy um, reforms uh, around the social safety net, around labor, et cetera, that the Green New Deal, right, tagging that, the sort of identity around sort of environment and climate to that is a messaging piece, right, to get people to kind of shift their kind of thinking around, um, you know, those set of, of issues. So why values, right? So I often, let me go back. So to say, um, we talk about sort of media creation, like we usually start with like, what are the values? How do we frame those values in a way? And then what are the messages we're creating, right? So those are kind of three steps that we use in terms of doing media and communications, um, you know, strategies. Um, and so when we talk about values, um, that's often a place I start with when I'm working with groups on creating messages for, for advocacy. So what are the values that we're sort of trying to impart, right, through looking at a, speci a specific issue, right? We can talk about, you know, values of fairness, of equality, of justice, of shared responsibility, of, you know, commonality. Um, this image is from uh, the Opportunity Agenda, which is a, a kind of messaging and communications uh, organization um, that I think kind of draws some of these things together in terms of, you know, we're all in this together, we all deserve a second chance, you know, these sorts of messages uh, that can be used for various, uh, you know, sort of uh, social issues. We talk about frames, right? So we're talking about how 
Um, and often we talk about frames in terms of how media frame particular issues or conversations, but I think it's something that we as advocates also need to be smart and strategic about. I love this image because <laughs> it's a it's a really clear way of explaining kind of how you know frames happen, right? So in in terms of media, so we see what's happening here in the actual you know out in the background, right? This person's chasing this person, right? But if you pull close, and so you see it, a different perspective on piece about PrEP and HIV where I went off about how they had framed PrEP and HIV in that, that scenario. Um, and that's often a tool, you know, opinion pieces is something we can use as advocates to, to challenge uh, some of those dominant media frames. So some conceptual frames that you might be familiar with that also make their way into the news that often, uh, you know, communications, uh, you know, consultants who are paid far more than I am uh, to help sort of frame these issues often for political parties. But we're all familiar with things like job killers and job creators, right? That's a frame. Uh, you know, Obamacare and Romney care, right, as a way to talk about what was the Affordable Care Act. And depending on who, you know, is hears that, uh, shapes what they think about that particular set of policies, right? Which is why the Republicans went with the Obamacare frame. Um, we remember 10, you know, what, 10, 15 years ago in the uh, kind of mortgage crisis in the United States, a lot of the media talked about people who bought too much house, as opposed to the fact that like banks and mortgage companies were actively, you know, uh, pursuing mostly poor and working class people with these, uh, you know, adjustable rate mortgages that, uh, you know, blew up in people's faces, right? Like that was what happened. <laughs> it wasn't that people, quote unquote, bought too much house. Um, but that was how it was often talked about. Um, in education, we talk about the school to prison pipeline, right? To talk about the connection between, uh, you know, police, uh, you know, in schools and, uh, you know, schools sort of moving to more, uh, you know, expulsions and those sorts of things that set kids up to be, uh, criminalized as opposed to given the kind of resources to 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 help them. Um, traditional marriage versus marriage equality, right? We all remember that from 10 years ago, right? Say personal responsibility frames, uh, big government, small government, all these things become sort of frames. Like I, this, you know, image is, I love this cartoon. Um, this is, really talks about how often in our society, who gets to, as Christian was saying, sort of talk about issues in front of the press. It is often not us, right? Or often not people with lived experiences through systems or, or issues, but, um, you know, a range of different, uh, often uh, corporate interests. Um, so then we talk about messages, right? And we're talking about, um, you know, how you bring together the core principle you want to communicate, right, in terms of values, uh, how you're going to frame those values, right, uh, to work that organize or structure your, your message meaning. And then the messages itself, like what is the actual just like text that we're going to use? Like what's the actual uh, way we're going to talk about, um, you know, specific uh, you know, things, which should include your values and frames. So here I just kind of gave an example of what that can look like, right? So oftentimes I'll sort of do this exercise with groups where we work on, you know, community. So taking a, a value that folks want to work on, say it's community and connectedness, right? And the way to frame that is like, we're all in this together, right? As a particular um, frame. So I've started to just come up with some messages. Sometimes when you're doing message development, like, Data and statistics can be really powerful, right, in terms of, you know, how you communicate. I remember years ago working with some environmental justice groups in Louisiana, and when they told me that, you know, a football field worth of coastal land disappears from the Gulf Coast every day, I was like, what? <laughs> What, we, that's where we're starting. Like that is where we're going to start, um, right? You know, in terms of like message development. So sometimes, you know, talking in this sense, you know, half a million C. diff infections in the United States. This is uh, data pulled from the CDC. Uh, you know, who are some of the folks most at risk? Senior citizens, people with compromised immune systems. Uh, you know, that one in 11 people over the age of 65 diagnosed, right? So, and I also found in preparation for this. Um, some studies like showing that people hospital hospitalized with COVID, if they contracted C. diff in the hospital, had much higher mortality rates, right? And 
I think given the fact, and so like using those kinds of things when you're, whether you're, you know, talking to media, talking to elected officials, et cetera, can be really helpful ways to sort of help the kind of hone on on those issues. And so part of what I, you know, what I would do after kind of giving that set of data, if I were talking to an elected official or, you know, a, a someone at one of the federal agencies, the NIH or NIAD or whatever, you know, is that, so you can see this really can impact anybody over a lifespan, right? Because, you know, if, you know, knock on wood, we'll all hit 65 at some point um, and, or just, you know, deal with a cancer diagnosis or a number of other things that, um, you know, put us in, um, you know, way of, of C. diff in terms of higher risk. Um, and then obviously talking about if you have a personal story, either yourself patients that you see, et cetera, about how this particular, um, you know, uh, condition impacts people, and then always leave with the actual what it is you want people to do. If it's an elected official, there's a, a policy ask, right? Or a federal, you know, someone working at a federal agency, right? If you're talking to like Dr. Fauci, what is the ask you want of NIAD, right, to do, right? Um, or it's a call to action, right, for policymakers, legislatures, or if you're talking to the media, to the public. What do you want the public to do uh, in terms of responding to, you know, a particular, a particular crisis? Um, so um, some things to do in terms of messages, uh, you know, you, that you want to do. So grounding your strategic communications work in one set of values and frames is essential. Right. So I would say to people, you can develop different messages from different audiences, but have essentially the same sort of frame and set of the same values and frames that you're working from. Um, you know, use a clear and thorough process to pick these, right? Ensuring that they will resonate, resonate across all circles of the community, right? Because, and, and so it's also to know, um, you know, I often tell people things to like stay away from in terms of creating messaging, like don't pit one disease group against another, right? I know in a lot of cases, people are like, oh, HIV gets all the money, <laughs> right? And so I think we're at a point now where, especially through COVID, we, public health has the attention of the globe in a way that we have not had in probably a hundred years, even in ways, especially in the U.S., even in ways that HIV did not galvanize the public around public health systems in a way. It was like, oh, let's test people and like maybe get people treatment. But like there was no real reckoning with the public health system in a way. I, to me, the way I see sort of happening now through COVID, right? So I think we're now at a place that we're not only, and also not just talking about the public health system, but we're, but these things are sort of coming together in ways that I think people now sort of understand the relationship between research uh, and public health uh, and also healthcare delivery systems. That those three things, while we all work on them differently or whatever, are actually very connected. And I think now people have a different understanding of that. And then conversations when I do sort of like, you know, communication stuff with, which I have done with, um, in other settings and talk about the way in which we have failed in COVID to, to do effective messaging. I mean, think about, if you remember, I re, you know, all of the different, like what, what kind of mask you should wear, should you double mask? You know, you don't need to mask. And like, all, like all of that, got, whether we're talking about a, a virus that is spread through, uh, that's airborne or through respiratory droplets or whatever, but the average person, what, like who gives a damn? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I understand from a scientific perspective why we need to answer those questions, but that public debate didn't do anything to help people know how to prevent contracting COVID, right? It just was really confusing. It made us look ridiculous, if, if you want my honest opinion. And so, like, that is the kind of thing that actually, like, engenders some of the mistrust and stuff we see. So communication stuff for me is not ancillary. It actually has to start at the very beginning. Like, not only working on, like, the you know, kind of research as we develop the kind of new em emerging infections or whatever. But we have to start thinking very early on about how we're communicating these things to folks. Uh, and, and the same with vaccines, right? All of the hesitancy and mistrust or whatever, part of which is because we have invested zero in the kind of education of people on how science works anymore. So we then find ourselves in a global pandemic and having to back into explaining to people how R&D works, how 
uh, what, how you explain sort of vaccine efficacy? What do those percentages mean? Uh, you know, what, how drugs are developed? All that, we're trying to do that in the midst and then get people confident enough to take them while we're, have done nothing to help kind of explain those things to people before that we get to a pandemic situation. Um, okay, ran over. Back to my slide. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, while your actual words, tones, and methods of communication may uh, offer, uh, may differ according to your audience, again, they must be consistent with your values and your core message. Personal stories combined with data sets uh, and an ask or demand is the best way to formulate messages when speaking to lawmakers and other decision makers. And again, I think um, I'll just say in closing that I think these things are super, super important when uh, we look at, you know, specifically various, you know, communities. I do a whole other presentation about sort of the medical mistrust and hesitation among African Americans and the legacy of Tuskegee and all of those sorts of things. And while like some of those historical markers are like very are important to people, what's actually more important is how people feel like they are treated in like healthcare settings now, right? Um, I just saw a study the other day that said that for, that looked uh, kind of a survey of, of African-Americans about, um, you know, how essentially looking at how COVID has shifted, whether people feel more trusting of medical systems or not or whatever. And it basically said that people trust, African-Americans by and large, they trust the science of things. They don't trust the systems to implement to them fairly, right? And that is the, that's the gap. Um, and I think that we, again, have to do more in terms of thinking about the role of media and communications um, as we do our work um, that really can help shift um, some of those dynamics. And some of that is also being honest to people of where the issues are, right? I often tell people, like when I have had people, particularly within the black community, who've raised various kinds of conspiracy theories about HIV, et cetera, to me. I'm like, there's racism in the system, right? That ain't it, <laughs> right? I'll talk to you about where it is, right? And where the work needs to happen, right? So I think it's also being honest about those things and not trying to gloss over, you know, whatever sort of issues that they are, but actually pointing people to where they are. And, and so validating the sense that things are unjust where people feel like that they are, uh, even while you may challenge their like, you know, kind of information, whether history or whatever, right, as a, as a tool to kind of bring people in as opposed to sort of pushing folks away. And I think that like doing more work in our public health around communications uh, is a really important way to do that. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take questions. So maybe this was this was wonderful, Kenny, and thank you for sharing. I love your passion, and I can see where it was it was born from the AIDS epidemic. As um, a corporate sponsor, now working in the in the C diff space, mm -hmm. what one word of advice would you give to a corporation when trying to address? patience, which is my job, to instill that sense of trust. I'm not trying to make you solve all of the issues around big pharma, but what can we <laughs> say, um, you know, with our messaging or what advice would you give to make sure that we're, we're being altruistic and we're coming across altruistically when we talk to our great advocates and patients about how we're truly invested in, in finding a cure for this disease? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I, I think the last part of what you said comes up a lot. So I hear often, um, you know, when I'm in in Ubers and Lyfts traveling around the country and, you know, talk to the Lyft or Uber driver and like, oh, what are you doing in town? And I talk about, you know, I do HIV work. People are always interested, right? And they always have questions. They never shut down. And, and oftentimes what I hear is almost every single time, don't you think they have the cure and they just not giving it to us because it's more money in the treatment treating people to the cure, right? And so I say, well, let's look at hepatitis C. <laughs> you know, to talk about like, you know, just how expensive those drugs are and whether, you know, that we created a cure, you know, in 2014 and, uh, you know, the access to such has been so dismal because of the price, right? So I think that to me where, uh, 
you know, sort of industry, you know, can do, you know, some work. So one is, I think, um, actually kind of funding and supporting um, the kinds of work around uh, demystifying research, right, for, for communities is hugely important. Because again, some of what happens in the space of, and there's, there's a, and I often say to people too, there's, there's, you know, kind of hesitancy, there's mistrust, and then there's conspiracy theory, right? And so you have to kind of know who you're talking to, right? Or like which, which place in that, which part of that spectrum that folks are, are on. But I think often it is like demystifying how those systems work. Um, that can be really critical to helping people sort of understand like what's going on. And to be, and I know this is a very hard for industry, but also like being honest about and transparent around what types of decisions get made around, um, you know, access, right? Which often a lot is set at price, right? And, and I know there's a lot of like back and forth about, you know, whether it's the payers, insurance companies, but like to me, this is the, the prices impacts everything downstream. And I, while I fight with insurance companies, we're doing a big thing right now uh, with insurance companies about, you know, who because of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force ruling that they payers, you know, had to pay for all prep you know, medications and ancillary services. And, and we started, we actually just like put a, a web, you know, kind of put a web page on a Google form and started sending it around the internet and asking people who are on prep, like if you're still being charged, right, co-pays or lab, you know, for labs or whatever to let us know. And finding that there's like, people are still paying, right, um, you know, these things. And so all that to say is like, that is often like a, a function of price, right? And set down. So I think to me, it's like transparency and like some of the business decision making. And then also just like spending resources on demystifying some of those systems, I think would do a lot for, for folks. Hi, my name is Jenny. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm actually very interested in some of the things you spoke of regarding the stigma surrounding HIV and the stigma surrounding C. diff uh -huh. and the messaging that goes along with those two things and how to de how to frame a message so that people are comfortable. Because I think a lot of um, the issue with C. diff is that people are ashamed of the word diarrhea. Uh -huh. And there's a lot of um, misinformation that's spreading like wildfire on social media uh -huh. with regard to how you catch C. diff and people feel dirty uh -huh. to discuss it. And it's there, you know, similarly to the stigma that goes along with HIV and the hesitancy uh -huh. to have an open dis public discourse about this particular infectious disease, there's a sort of victim blaming yep. or patient blaming that goes along with it. And I'm just curious about how you think the best way to kind of um, extinguish these digital, you know, wildfires on the internet of misinformation? Yeah, that's really hard. <laughs> yeah, I because, mean, I, no, I'm, I'm no, working I'm not... in, in, in the area of multi-sectoral engagement. Yeah. So I'm just curious about how you think, you know, partnerships through government and private actors can come together to kind of squash the stigma. Yeah, and what what I said it was really hard. I don't. I mean, what's what's harder is the role of like social media, because um, I, you know, at managing Facebook pages and groups or whatever. I mean, I've spent so much time, or other staff that I supported, spent so much time just deleting conspiracy theory comments. Correct. Like, right? So it's hard to, it you know, and so that to me is that's that's needs federal legis legislative intervention, right? right? Like in terms of social media companies taking some responsibility for like what get, I mean, you know, we're talking about that in relationship to the 2020 elections and other things, right. but like, but uh, kind of disease misinformation and stuff is in conspiracy theories is a, is a huge part of like that piece. But I think that specific to um, you know, the stigma and kind of working with patients, I think, um, you know, some of it comes through, you know, some of, some of the work, uh, you know, we learned from HIV over the last 40 years. It's like, you know, doing funding and doing this sort of like convenings and support groups of people who've lived, you know, who've survived C. diff and, um, 
and helping build to do the kind of leadership development work to help people feel comfortable with telling their stories, right? That you know, so it, it is important for people. And I and I think um, also thinking about some things I think we need to do generally in public health around a number of conditions. Like, yeah, we have to be faster and smarter about intervention on, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, on social media platforms. One of the things I have in some conversations I've recently had with folks at CDC is like, just through the, just through COVID, like, you know, we should have been developing animated videos mm -hmm. <laughs> almost every week over the last two years with, with, time stamped with, you know, so that people knew this is what we know about the virus now or about vaccinations now. This is how the vaccines were created. This is how, you know, or doing things around, you know, even kind of the, the stigma pieces around, you know, C. diff and diarrhea and things like that, right? To, to um, we have to be much faster and more nimble to kind of get those messaging, to get that kind of messaging out. I think working with patient advocates is a way to sort of do that, to kind of give people space and help them elevate their stories on specific platforms to, you know, create more awareness. But some of it is like, also, we just, we can do more to kind of like challenge some of these, these system or just kind of, especially the things that happen on social media, which move at the rate of, you know, Wildfire. faster than any right. one of us. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kenyon. I really appreciate oh, what you've uh, shared with us today. And it, it like, I, I have various, uh, my name is Tim Dawson. I, I, I work, I'm coming here today from the Art of Democracy, where I'm a civic engagement consultant. Um, I just have a lot of different notes that I took down while you were talking, so forgive me if I if my question turns out somewhat rambling. Uh, I guess I do have a question, though. Uh, one of the things that that you asked us to think about was the challenging systems that we're trying to insert messages into, and I'm wondering uh, if you could help us think about how some of the messaging and the strategies that you're employing are might maybe helping to replicate that system rather than to address the challenges in the system. So for example, I was thinking of the fact that young children today are being taught to be very, very um, uh, media literacy in their schools and they're being taught to be very suspicious of messaging, right? And being very, you know, look on several sides and I imagine that after receiving a message like the one that you, you suggested that we craft, I might be immediately primed to think, oh, well, what is the other side of this question, right? And, and I'm thinking about how, you can, how we can create messages that will help in that thinking through process, that kind of after you've delivered your message. What is the, you know, how can somebody follow up on that in ways that won't end up diminishing the power of my message. So for example, you mentioned you don't want to pit diseases against one another, for example, right? But you also, and my question was, well, if you appear very one-sided, then you're just welcoming somebody to bring in another side and that's going to confuse a decision maker. They're going to be like, there's just so many different people competing for this pot of money, for example, right? That I, all of these sides coming at me with their own credible information, I know there's always another side to be thinking about rather than my message itself to help them think about those other sides and come to the conclusion that my side was the one that they should be following or, or, or my path should be the one that's following. And I'm sorry if that wasn't clear. So if, please ask to, me I'm questions. A, <laughs> I'll try to address it. Um, so I think that, um, so, I mean, some of that is to some extent unavoidable and that there will always be some, you know, kind of a person or a set of political interests or whatever that will debate, you know, whatever the other, whatever the quote unquote other, other side is. I, I think that part of it is, is a couple things. One is, um, I have found in doing, whenever I, especially working with like, you know, policymakers and elected officials to kind of educate them on specific issues, like if they, one, you are backing up what you say with like, you know, data from credible sources, right? Two, you are effectively then also, you know, having people speak to their own, you know, lived experience, whatever that may be related to the issue as, as a piece of that. Um, and third is just also being prepared for, you know, what you know are your, the kind of opposition, right? I, every time I write a press release or I write an essay or whatever I'm doing, 
I always think about when I am editing my own work, what, okay, I'm looking for the holes, right? Or what I think other people who would have opposition to this would think, and I'm address it in the, you know, like I'm a, like, that's just, and so some of it is just, um, just understanding that that's going to be the case and then also challenging. Now, I, I do also think that, um, you know, I, again, it's another question of like one of the things that I think are, you know, especially CDC and other kind of federal agencies in public health and research have to do a better job of, I think, is taking less of a kind of, you know, s seemingly neutral sort of like, I don't think that that's working. And, that, and it's also been one of the problems with journalists, right? And, I, you know, I am a trained journalist. I talk to journalists all the time, is that you know, we the, mo the most glaring example is like the climate debate, right, where they will just in order to have an other side pull someone who is completely from a discredible, like, you know, organization or is clearly backed by a range of interests or whatever in a news piece, just to say that there's once another side, despite the fact that there are is pretty clear uh, alignment in science about what is actually occurring. Right. And so um, I, so some of it is just like, yeah. And, and also in, in whatever kind of, you know, field in, in public health or whatever. Yeah. Knowing who some of those groups and stuff are like I know who, you know, where I try to like know kind of who when I and when I read news stories, when I see people saying things that I know are false or are whatever, I go look those people up if they're issues that I work on. Right. I look them up right, <laughs> and figure out where, what is the, you know, what is the dynamic there? What are their interests? Right. Um, and so none of this is also anything. There's no like magic bullet. And this is all kind of solvable in one day. But I think that the kind of pieces around building the voices of, of patients and doing that kind of like leadership development to help them tell their own stories. And then how do we sort of bring that to, to decision makers and other platforms to both educate and also reduce the kind of stigma that exists? And then what is the policy level work, you know, that, that we need to do to sort of change systems, right? Like th to me, like those are the three is, is you know, leadership development, it's uh, and, and also kind of advocacy and organizing, uh, you know, for policy change. And it's like strategic communications. Like those are the three pieces of like what we have to do, <laughs> you know, all together. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kenyon. Um, we have one last one question, sure. comment. Okay. Hi, thank you very much, Kenyon. My name is Marianne Webb, and I just, I'm a C. diff survivor. And when we were talking about how we frame C. diff and C. diff awareness, one of the things that has um, angered me over the course of the past couple of years is that, first of all, of course, nobody wants to talk about diarrhea. Okay, we all need to grow up. But we can't do that when we talk, when we, you know, show emojis of poop with eyeballs on them. And I seriously just think that there should be black box warnings on and antibiotics and people need to talk about it in a mature way, the same they, way they would talk about something else. And I don't think we do ourselves any favors by, you know, by using sort of childish um, imagery to talk about something that is deadly, deathly serious. And I think when we do that and we frame it that way, people will begin to ha have a shift in their mindset rather than, oh, it's just some old person and, you know, isn't that a cute poop emoji? So that's all I have. <laughs> do you have thoughts on that? I think that's more of a comment than a question. <laughs> right. I, the only thing I'll say, like, I, I, I hear you. I think... Um, Depend, I would just say that I think depending different audiences sometimes require different things. And I think that uh, making clear the seriousness of, a, of an issue and a condition is important. I think where, where I feel challenged a little bit is like, I feel like in public health sometimes, like we lean too much into the scare tactics of things. And past a certain point, that turns people off too. Because if it's just you know, gloom and doom and everything is like, you know, it's frightening, then people are afraid. It's like, think about when, if you were happy, if you took sex ed in high school, right? <laughs> and they show you all the things, right? 
congenital syphilis, you know, genital herpes. They show you all the things and you are, you know, terrified until you're horny, right? So you're, ter- you're and at 15, you're terrified until like 30 minutes later. So like, <laughs> you know, and so if we do that without some other context and tools and et cetera, like, I think it's important to give people that information. And I think it is important for people to understand the seriousness of things. But I also think that like, you know, we had, there's a fine line between that and what is traditionally a range of scare tactics that public health kind of communications campaigns, marketing campaigns usually use that I think some ways end up actually re-stigmatizing people who have those conditions. And then B, for people who don't, it becomes, you know, you're scared for a short period of time, but that doesn't become a motivating factor past a certain point. Like that would be.